Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, the domestication of cats took longer than we thought, the brains of flying reptiles are studied, a super puff exoplanet is losing a lot of helium, and much more. Get Boris? I think we probably should have written something in the script about Boris being on sale, but we didn't. So the script is just flying past at the moment and I'm making this up as I go along. But Boris is on sale at the moment. He's only gonna be on sale until I think December the 22nd. Um, we have to hit 250 sales in order to produce him at all. So if you want one, make sure you and everyone else gets at least 20. Look at this little guy. I love him. And now I'm going to have to turn back the script because it's going on about cats and I haven't got there yet. Our top story this week is all about cats, as two new studies have been published this week, shedding light on the tale of how these cuddly companions became domesticated. As it turns out, they really took their time, being domesticated much more recently than we'd previously thought. Domestic cats, Felis catus, are descendants of the African wildcat, a species called Felis libica libica, which is today distributed across North Africa and the Near East. However, the exact timing of when domestic cats originated has been unclear, as few ancient cat genomes have been analysed so far. It has also been uncertain how cats spread into Europe and further across the ancient world. Two potential regions where cat domestication may have occurred have been identified. The Neolithic Levant area about 9,500 years ago was one contender, given that a site in Cyprus preserves a Neolithic farmer buried alongside a cat. The other time and region was ancient Egypt around 3,500 years ago, as there is extensive evidence from Egyptian culture that cats were important to them, such as mummified cats and many depictions of their furry friends. Previously, studies that only analysed mitochondrial DNA supported a scenario where cats dispersed from both regions, being spread by Neolithic farmers moving from Turkey into Europe about 6,400 years ago, followed by a second wave of dispersal from Egypt into Europe about 2,000 years ago. However, this new research indicates that ancient gene flow between wild cat populations, meaning extensive interbreeding among different groups, may have obscured the animal's genetic history, especially when only mitochondrial DNA was examined. To shed light on these mysteries, the researchers analysed the genomes of 70 ancient cats from various archaeological sites in Europe and Anatolia, as well as the genomes of 17 modern wild cats from Europe and North Africa. So what did they discover? Well, firstly, they discovered that ancient cats living between 9,500 and 6,300 years ago in Europe and Anatolia, which had previously been identified as containing mitochondrial DNA from African wild cats and therefore thought to be evidence of early domestication of this species, were, in fact, European wild cats, Felis sylvestris. The ancestors of these European wildcats had previously hybridised with African wildcats, which is why they had their mitochondrial DNA. The oldest cats in Europe that were genetically close to the African wildcat, and therefore also the modern domestic cat, lived around 2,000 years ago. So, it turns out that it's only from about 2,000 years ago onwards that domestic cats spread across Europe. Before this, people here only interacted with European wildcats. It's interesting to think that they still had relationships with these cats too, since that Neolithic burial we mentioned was buried with one of these wild cats, they must still have been important to these ancient people. The authors caution that these are still early steps in developing our understanding of how domestic cats entered Europe, and we still need more data from ancient cat genomes in Egypt and North African regions to pinpoint where the modern domestic cats originated. Another intriguing aspect of this paper is that the authors discovered that the modern population of wild cats living on the island of Sardinia, Italy, originated from a separate, slightly older dispersal of African wild cats about 2,200 years ago. Therefore, 
cat dispersal out of Africa was, much like with our own species, a complex process, and there is still much to learn about it. The other cat-themed paper from a different team of researchers but published on the same day presents the results of analyses on various small cat bones from the archaeological sites across China over the past 5,000 years. This study led to another fascinating discovery. Modern domestic cats only arrived in China around 1,400 years ago, likely brought by Silk Road merchants. Before this time though, people in China were living with leopard cats. From around 5,400 years ago until just 150 CE, these leopard cats seem to have engaged in a commensal existence with humans, perhaps preying on rodents in human environments and in turn being provided with shelter by the people here. However, after the collapse of the Han Dynasty around 200 CE, all evidence of leopard cats living alongside humans disappeared. So, cat domestication was a complicated but relatively very recent process, and these two papers offer some fascinating insight into how it all happened. And now, cats rule the internet. Also, I'd like to thank my co-hosts for this story, Ben's cats, Grendel and Morgana. You both did a great job. Next, to keep things balanced, we also have a story about dog genetics. A team of scientists analysed nearly 2,700 genomes from ancient and modern dogs and wolves, revealing that almost two-thirds of dog breeds have wolf ancestry, resulting from crossbreeding that occurred around 1,000 generations ago, after they'd already been domesticated. Domestic dogs, of course, descend from a wolf population that humans influenced some 15 to 20,000 years ago, but many modern dog breeds are so far removed from this ancestral stock that it's easy to forget their origins. This study found that the genomes of various dog breeds can actually tolerate wolf DNA up to a certain level, and this DNA contributes to the traits that have been selected for in some breeds, influencing their size and behaviour. The study examines the relative wolfiness of these breeds, discovering that, apart from wolf dogs, which have been deliberately hybridised with wolves, the great Anglo-French tricolour hound contains the most wolf ancestry, followed by the Tamascan and the Shiloh shepherd dog. Conversely, terriers, gun dogs and scent hounds generally have the least amount of post-domestication wolf ancestry, and some breeds, of course, possess none at all. Also, I think it's important to note that Chihuahuas have about 0.2% post-domestication wolf ancestry, which explains a lot. There's more news from the ancient world next as we travel back millions of years to the age of reptiles, with a new study investigating how pterosaur brains evolved as these animals became flyers. Pterosaurs are known from fossils dating back as far as 220 million years ago. It's hypothesised that they evolved from a lineage of Triassic reptiles called the Lagopetids. And in this new research, the brain structure of Lagopetids, obtained from high-resolution brain case scans, was compared to the structures of pterosaur, bird, dinosaur and other reptile brains. Although birds and pterosaurs evolved to fly in very different ways, and bird brains are relatively much larger than those in pterosaurs, it has been hypothesised that their structures evolved in similar ways, since flight demands enlarged optic lobes to allow improved processing of visual information. This study revealed that flying pterosaurs actually have brains more similar to those of non-flying dinosaurs rather than modern birds. This means that birds underwent many later modifications to their brain structures compared to pterosaurs. The brains of pterosaurs are also quite different from those of their lagopetid relatives, suggesting that pterosaur brains underwent rapid evolution once they became flight capable, rather than evolving in a more gradual and stepwise manner like bird brains. More exciting paleontology news up next, as a fascinating new study has been published redescribing a specimen of mummified dinosaur. The specimen in question is a sandstone block containing pieces of vertebrae, ribs, and the back of a skull of an Edmontosaurin, a type of hadrosaur, one of the so-called duck-billed dinosaurs. This Edmontosaurin specimen was first published in 2014, when it was realised that the area around the back of the skull also preserved the mummified remnants of a soft tissue crest. 
This crest, or comb as it's also been called, reveals for the first time that at least some hadrosaurs, which were thought to lack crests like their extravagant relatives with bony ornaments, did have such structures. Now, this new research has shown that the crest actually covered most of the skull roof and also had a crenellated front margin. Additionally, the classification of the specimen is discussed, with this new research finding that it differs in key aspects from both known species of Edmontosaurus. There isn't enough of the skeleton to name it as a new species, however, so they called it simply the Red Willow Edmontosaurin. The paper also discusses how the mummified skin in the specimen indicates evidence of scavenging on the carcass and explores the possible anatomy of soft tissue crests in other hadrosaurs. A very interesting paper indeed. We have some more exciting prehistoric news this week as research have discovered evidence of ancient humans hunting aurochs, the wild ancestors of cattle. The paper explains how there has been much discussion over whether humans practiced mass hunting before 50,000 years ago. If they did, it would suggest a lot of planning, communication and cooperation among individuals, pointing to larger scale enterprises than most other known human activities in the Paleolithic. This research focuses on a site dating to around 120,000 years ago in Israel, where archaic humans would have repeatedly interacted with early modern humans. Many aurochs bones were found here, showing signs of butchery by humans, and one particular leg bone also had an embedded flint chip that the bone had begun to heal around, indicating that the archaic humans recaptured this individual after an initial failed hunt. However, no evidence of large-scale mass hunting of the aurochs was discovered. Instead, they were probably killed during many separate, isolated but planned hunts. As such, the researchers conclude that middle Pleistocene archaic humans, in this case possibly Neanderthals or their close relatives, lived in small, dispersed and disconnected groups, which may have put them at a disadvantage when modern humans arrived in the region. We're heading back to what always seems to be science's favourite planet next, as mini lightning has been detected on Mars. Lightning has been detected on Earth before, obviously, but also on our gas giants, Saturn and Jupiter. ESA's Mars Express failed to find radio signals suggesting lightning on Mars after five years of trying, ending in 2010. And six years later, a joint mission by ESA and Roscosmos to measure electrical activity on Mars during dust storms failed before it had even begun, crashing upon landing and being rendered useless. A follow-up mission has not borne fruit, but this week, scientists think they have found the evidence they've been looking for, using something that was already there. NASA's Perseverance rover landed on the Red Planet in February of 2021 and carries a microphone that has recorded what researchers think is sounds of electrical discharges in the atmosphere. The authors of a study published this week in the journal Nature identified interference from electromagnetic radiation that lines up with what would be expected from electrical discharge in the atmosphere. This is pretty good evidence that, as has previously been suggested, dust can induce these electrical discharges that we've seen on planets before. But what does it mean for humans on Mars? Well, while it doesn't seem to pose any danger to people specifically, these discharges could potentially damage particularly sensitive equipment. Moving on to a planet much further away finds us in the WASP-107 system, sitting at about 212 light years away from us. WASP 107b, an exoplanet in this system, is known as one of the strangest exoplanets ever discovered. It's nearly double the mass of Neptune and the size of Jupiter, making it one of the least dense planets ever discovered. Planets with this low level of density have been dubbed super puff planets. It is thought that one way it can retain its structural integrity is because it is so close to its star, and a study published this week in Nature Astronomy has made several more interesting findings about WASP-107b. Using various instruments on the James Webb Space Telescope, the researchers found that a vast amount of helium is leaving the planet's atmosphere. These helium flows are present both behind and in front of the planet as it orbits the star. The data gathered for this study also confirmed the presence of water on WASP-107b and traces of other chemical mixtures as well, such as carbon dioxide. 
They also found that the planet would have formed further out from its star, but its orbit has recently, at least in cosmological terms, become much closer to its star. All fascinating information that helps inform us of what the wider universe is like. Finally for the news this week, a remarkable breakthrough has been achieved in the protection of sharks and rays. It is a turning point for species that have been pushed towards extinction by overfishing, climate change, and the global trade in fins, meat, and liver oil. Countries agreed by consensus to tighten restrictions on more than 70 shark and ray species. Whale sharks, all manta rays, and all devil rays have been moved to Appendix 1. That means a complete ban on their international commercial trade. The meeting also delivered new safeguards for several other threatened sharks. Tope sharks, smooth hounds, and deepwater gulper sharks were added to Appendix 2. That means trade isn't banned, but it's tightly regulated and only allowed if countries can prove it won't harm wild populations. Gulper sharks in particular have been heavily targeted for squalene, an oil used in cosmetics, even though plant-based alternatives exist. Meanwhile, guitar fishes and wedge fishes, which are amongst some of the most endangered rays in the world, were given a zero export quota, effectively shutting down all legal international trade. Conservation groups are calling this meeting a major win. With over 100 million sharks killed each year, experts say these new rules reflect a global shift in the treatment of sharks as wildlife in need of protection, not just as fishery resources. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Before we go, I want to introduce you to this marvelous guy here. And there's a, there's a bit in the script here. I, I did that bit early on for no reason. This is Boris the Boreal Appelta. We've been working with the wonderful people over at Plush Foundry to bring you a scientifically accurate colored Boreal Appelta plushie, complete with counter shading that features a reddish brown upper surface and a lighter underside, similar to what the real dinosaur would have had. But we need your help to make Boris a reality and to fund the campaign to get Boris made and sent out to everyone who orders one. Be sure to check out the link in the description below and the pinned comment if I can remember if you'd like to get your own Boris and spread the word. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons including Andrew Cowam, Chang Yin, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Clara Middleton, Dina Bather, Diana Hernandez, Drav Srivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, Irage, Joyran Joydevik, John French, Joseph Ree, Josh Lambert, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Nikolaus York, Ralph Balzac, Robert Pietrzyka Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Betrykus, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, Tracy Merrifield, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.